Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to those who are joining us from the US. Um, my name is Marta Kubica and I'm the CEO of Elnet Central in Eastern Europe. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to welcome all the participants. Uh, we have with us members of parliament, including senators, diplomats, representatives from the European Parliament and women's rights activists across Europe. Our mission, Elnet's mission, is to bring Europe and Israel together, especially in such trying times. Since October 7, we brought to Israel almost 100 European policymakers on solidarity missions. They wanted to come to Israel to learn, see the sites, and speak up about the atrocities committed by Hamas on mostly civilian Israeli population. And even though Hamas, the, the Hamas massacre was live streamed, we all remember horrible videos of girls being abducted, uh, wearing clothes covered in blood, which clearly comes from physical violation and rape. And the horrific videos are still available online. Many voices in the world are either doubting the events of October 7 or completely forgetting Israeli women. There are still 138 civilians held hostage in Gaza, including babies and el elderly, and we hope and pray every day for their well-being and safe return home. This is why we created this event, to shed light and expose the crimes committed by Hamas, especially on Israeli women and girls, on October 7th and afterwards. Our intention was to host it as a part of worldwide events surrounding the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which was established by the UN on October 25th. It took the same UN nearly 60 days to finally condemn Hamas, but they did so while referring to situation to the existing UN Commission of Inquiry. The commission has proven itself to be grossly <coughs> biased against Israel. Before we start our event today, um, I have a technical announcement. There is a translation into French. You can uh, click the globe uh, on Zoom and you will be able to move to the French translation. And I also have a trigger warning um, because some of the content that will be discussed will be very graphic and disturbing. And I suggest that if any point, if it is necessary, you can, uh, you can put the Zoom on silent and return to us. We're very lucky to be hosting today panelists, a uh, member of the Knesset, Shelly Talmeron, who is with us, and uh, an expert in international law and the leader of the Civil Commission on the, seven, uh, on the October 7th crimes by Hamas against women and children, uh, Kohav, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Kohav El, El Kayam Levy. Before I introduce our speakers, we have uh, we have a message from the Czech Minister of Defense, uh, who sadly couldn't join us right now due to the prior um, prior engagements. But she recorded a very strong and very important message for us. Czech Republic has been always a great friend of Israel, and they're also proving that in this horrific, horrific time. So. Please stay with us uh, to see to see the video and the and the message from the Czech Minister uh, Czech Minister of Defense, Mr. Jana Chernohova. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all for participating in this event of a great importance. You are meeting today to address the horror events that took place on October. Seven this year. We witnessed horrible stories of a torture, murders, executions, rapes, and many other forms of absolutely inhumane practices that are hard to even imagine. These events will be remembered as some of the darkest moments in the history of Israel. By some, it is being described as the bloodiest day for Jews since the Second World War. And I add, not just for Jews, but for the whole humanity. 
not just that innocent Israelis were targeted by the Hamas terrorist, but girls and women were deliberately used as a strategic tool in this barbaric attack. And yet the world stays largely silent. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to address you today, to support this meeting. We must also push on the release of all hostages who are still held by Hamas. Finally, let this meeting be a call to action for the international community to support women and children suffering in armed conflict. We cannot remain silent. We have to speak up. My thoughts and prayers are with all of the women who had to go through such things. Once again, thank you all. Shalom. <clears throat> Minister Chernohova is supporting Israel from day one, uh, much longer, much earlier than October 7th. Um, that's why we're very happy and very grateful that she want, she joined us in this virtual capacity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to move to our first speaker, a uh, member of the Knesset, <coughs> Shelly Talmeron. She's a member uh, of the Gender Equality, Immigration and Science and Technology Committee. Uh, she represents the opposition party Yesh Atid, um, which is a centralist liberal party. Uh, Shelly Meron served as a captain in the Israeli Air Force for seven years when she was an ops officer as well as a spokesperson. She worked as a business development manager in the high-tech industry in Southeast Asia for over a decade and was a political activist and community leader in Tel Aviv within PTAs. A uh, member of the Knesset, Shelly Talmeron, uh, is also a member of the Knesset Committee on the Status of Women. And I'm really looking forward, hopefully, to host her next week in Warsaw at the Parliament, where we're going to conduct a similar event, but this time in person, together with Polish members of the par Parliament and Senators. Uh, Shelly, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marta. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, this important event today. I truly appreciate it. Let me start by apologizing, since today uh, we are voting within our Parliament on the budget. And as you probably all know, it's a very uh, complicated day here, and things are very dynamic. So, unfortunately, I'll be ha probably I'll be called out to go vote sometimes sometime during our our meeting. So, hopefully, I'll be able to uh, say uh, all the things that I plan to say, and hopefully, I can do it within a few minutes and then come back to you uh, and continue. Uh, so, my apologies for that. First of all, it's nice to meet you all. My name is Shelley. I'm a member of the Knesset in Israel. Uh, I wish we would be meeting under different circumstances. I wish we would be talking about uh, gender equality, uh, maybe discussing uh, peace negotiations between Israel and our neighbors, uh, or any other cooperation that we might do between our parliaments or organizations. But unfortunately, um, our country has suffered the worst tragedy since the state of Israel was uh, established 75 years ago, maybe since the Holocaust, uh, uh, since the Second World War. You know, I can give you the numbers. I can tell you about so many people that were murdered, beheaded, raped, stabbed, burned alive, and many, many, many other atrocities. But I choose to take advantage of the time that we have together um, to talk about the human side of things and, of course, with focus on women. As Martha said, I'm a member of uh, the Gender Equality Committee in the Knesset, and I'm used to fighting for, for women, but not under these circumstances. So first and foremost, I want to tell you that I'm a mother. I have two daughters. One is 17 years old and one is 13 years old. My 17-year-old will be joining the army uh, in a year. You know, everybody joins the army here at the age of 18. 
And uh, I, I was an officer in the Air Force for seven years. And I think that it had a lot to do with my personality and the way that I developed as a human being. It, it affected me very much. So before we dive into the, um, into the examples and the things that I want to describe to you, I just want to show you behind me. You can see this huge picture. This is a picture of 240 people who were held as hostages in Gaza. I'm not sure if you know the story, the whole story of what happened here on October 7th, but it was a Saturday. Uh, Saturday for us is weekend, right? It's like a Sunday in Europe. And it was a Jewish holiday, 6.30 in the morning, sirens started going off. I was in Tel Aviv, of course. And when we have sirens, we know we have to run to the bomb shelter because there are missiles. But we had no idea that this started a horrible, horrible war. We were surprised. Um, on that day, we had over 1,200 people murdered and we had 250 people taken into Gaza. When I say people, I, I mean babies, children, young girls, young boys, uh, and of course, elderly people, over 85 year old people. Just imagine your grandfather or worse, your grandmother being taken out of her bed brutally six o'clock in the morning and taken into Gaza by force. Really, it's, it's un unimaginable. Um, last week, we had uh, 80 people out of the hostages come back to Israel. Many of them were children uh, and women. But unfortunately, we still have um, many, many hostages being held in, in Gaza. Uh, among them, we still have 17 women within that list, list and two little children. One of them is Kfir. He was taken as a nine-month-old baby. Now he's 11 months old. And his, young, his older brother, Ariel, which is four years old. Just imagine these little children being taken into Gaza into tunnels. We have no idea what the situation is with them. We have no idea if they're even alive. So I think that I wanna begin by um, showing you, and it's, it's more important that you listen, right? You can read the, um, the subtitles, but what I, wanna, what I wanna show you is a part of, um, you know, we had the music festival that day. We had like three or 4,000 people dancing at a music festival, young people around their 20s mostly. And we had thousands of terrorists that invaded our country that morning. And they went to this party and they uh, murdered over uh, 300 people there. It's more close to 400 young people at that music festival. Um, and during that terrible, terrible massacre, one of the girls, her name is Maya. She's 21 years old. Maybe I can show you. This is her. She's 21 years old and her brother is 18 years old. They were shot and taken as hostages into Gaza. And what I wanna show you is the phone call that she called her father. She was screaming um, for him to help her. So Malta, if you can please put the sound on for a second. Absolutely. I'm sorry you had to listen to this, but this is our reality. This is only one story out of thousands of stories that occurred on that day. Now, this is not uh, 
a case that only has to do with women, but I wanted to give you this as an example because Maya was shot. She, uh, she was speaking to her father on the phone and you heard her screaming for him to help her. She said, they're killing us, they're killing us, they shot me. And she was screaming, dad, dad, Abba, that's the word in, in Hebrew. And you saw the parents showing the tape to, to a journalist. Just imagine these two parents, their children went to a party, just like all of us, right? Normal people. And um, to our greatest, um, we're, we're very happy that these two, the, the brother and the, sis the sister were returned to Israel, but she was wounded and she wasn't taken care of properly in Gaza. She had to go through surgery here last week because her leg is in a horrible state from the shooting. And she still has a lot of medical issues that she has to deal with. As you know, the Red Cross did not go in and visit any of the hostages. So they weren't take, taken care of as they should have been. And these are just two examples of people who are held hostage, but I can give you many, many uh, examples. And now that we have 80 people that came back, they're starting to talk about what they went through. And I'm telling you, the stories that they're telling us is really, it's, it's inexplicable. I can't even imagine the reality that they were living in. Most of them were in the tunnels. Some of them were held hostage in houses uh, all over Gaza. And you know, there is one hostage, a woman around 50 years old that came back and they were so used to sitting on the ground and not speaking, being quiet. And when you had to go use the bathroom, you would knock on the door and wait probably a few hours until somebody comes and takes you to go to the bathroom. She was telling a story. I'm uh, sorry, I, she told, um, we were told that right now when she got back home, she was in the hospital and now she's released to her house. She's sitting in a room and she won't go out of the room. And every time she wants to go to use the bathroom, she knocks on the door and she waits for someone to come take her. This is a 50 something year old woman, not a child. The trauma that these people are going through is in incredible. And we need all of the hostages to come back. Of course the women, but we need the hostages to come back now. Now everybody knows that Hamas is a terror organization. We're not dealing with a normal government or a country or a state. This is a terror organization. This is not a problem only for the state of Israel because this terror organization wants to do the same all over the free world and the Western world. And we should all take that into account. Now, this was graphic what I, what I showed you, but there are other examples that are even worse. So I just wanna describe to you a little bit of the evidence that we have about what happened to women on that day and in captivity. And I'm saying again, it's a little harsh. It's difficult to hear it, but I think that you have to hear it in order to understand what these women went through and probably going through right now in Gaza. So we had um, an Israeli young man, his name is Yoni Sadon, who went to the festival. And he uh, gave his testimony to the, the police about what he saw there. And he said, I'm quoting, eight or 10 fighters, terrorists, beating and raping her before she was shot and killed. When they finished, they were laughing. They were handing her over from one to the other. They were pulling her hair from the back. And one of the girls that was raped in this form, because there were a few of these women that, was, that were raped in this manner, he was raping her and he shot her during the rape. And some of them were shot in the back of their heads. That is one evidence. We have Nachman Dickstein, who is a volunteer in Zaka. Zaka is an organization in Israel that deals with unfortunately, the dead people, they uh, save their, we sacrifice the living and we also sacrifice the dead. We, we take care of them, we prepare them for burial. And these volunteers had to collect all of the bodies from all over our towns and the festival and everywhere that 
Jewish people and not only Jewish people were murdered. And he said that he saw dozens of women in shelters. As you know, the terrorists went into homes of our civilians that were hiding in the, uh, we have a special room that's like a bomb shelter within each home to defend you from missiles. So they found dozens of dead women in shelters. Their clothing was torn on the upper part, but their bottoms were completely naked. So they found many bodies in this situation. Karmit Palti Katsir, which is the daughter of one of the uh, hostages, an elderly woman who is 77 years old, said that her mother was okay when she went to Gaza. She had no heart problems. And when she came back, her uh, situation deteriorated very, very fast. And now she has many heart problems and she's in a bad situation. And we're hoping that she stays alive. I'm not sure if you saw the video of Naama Levi, which is a 19 year old girl from Israel that is being kept in Gaza as a hostage. On the video, we can see her being dragged by her hair, being pulled out of the back of a Jeep and dragged into the front of the Jeep. She's bleeding, her pants are full of blood and the blood is streaming down her legs. Um, she's completely covered in blood. And we have some of the uh, officers in the police force that have testimonies of what they saw. So one of the testimonies says, in a bomb shelter, the door was full of bullets. Next to it were two women, mother and daughter, who were shot. In the next room, a girl about 19 years old, pants rolled down. In the corner of the room, there is a pile of tiles. And when you take them down slowly, you see a body of a naked woman with a sharp object stuck in her groin. Rescuers saw the bodies of women with swollen breasts and no underwear hundreds of mutilated bodies. Sherry, who is one of the wonderful women who prepared many victims for burial, said that they were no. young women, most with little clothing or torn up clothing, their bodies completely full of blood, but mostly in their underwear. Many of them shot many times in the face just to mutilate them. There's another video, a horrifying video of a young woman in her 20s photographed inside the Gaza Strip already. She's unconscious and half naked and surrounded by men. I, I, I have more and more evidence that I can read to you, but I can tell you that the things that they've done are really, I, I don't even know how a human can think of such sadistic, horrible, terrifying acts of crime crimes against humanity, crimes against women. In some cases, they cut off the breasts of women and started throwing it around between them and playing with it. There were little girls that they stripped down. They found them dead, stripped down. I'm not sure if you saw there was a... Um, there was a discussion in the UN just a few days ago with uh, uh, some people from Israel that came over to discuss what happened to, to Israeli women. And they gave the testimonies there and it was, it was horrific. You can look it up and see, and see the, the, um, the videos. Please, please excuse me, I have to go vote and maybe I'll come back in a few minutes and maybe Kochav can continue and then will get back to me. I'm really sorry, but I have to go vote. Is that okay, Marco? Uh Absolutely. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you. I'll be back soon. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I would like to I would like to move to our next speaker, um, Dr. Kohav El Kayam Levy, who is uh, an expert in international law, a visiting professor at the Reichman University, postdoc fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute for International Relations at the Hebrew University and uh, founding head of the Deborah Institute for, for Gender and Sustainability Studies. 
Um, in the immediate wake of the Hamas attack against Israel, Dr. Kohav El Kayam Levy established and it's leading the civil commission on October 7th crimes by Hamas against women and children. Um, the civil commission um, is an independent, non governmental collaboration of international human rights experts and women's rights organizations created to advocate for and support the investigation of war crimes committed by Hamas against women and children during the massacre of October 7, 2023, and the continuous war crimes towards abducted women and children. Kohav, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for doing what you do. I can't even imagine how horrible is your daily work right now. But again, thank you so much for what you're doing. And I'll be happy to hear if there is anything that we as international community, especially in Europe, what can we do to help and to support the case? Thank you. Thank you so much. I apologize that I'm joining from my phone, just that uh, I'm in New York and the adapter to the electricity uh, for some reason uh, broke just before this meeting. So my apologies. I hope you can hear me well. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let me just quickly introduce myself. As uh, uh, Ilani, as Marta said, uh, my name is Dr. Kohabel Kayam Levy. I'm uh, uh, I teach international law, human rights law, climate justice, feminist theories uh, in international law and international uh, relations in uh, Hebrew University and Reichman University and had uh, an Institute on Gender and Sustainability. Uh, I feel the need to, to share um, a little bit uh, of all this work uh, that I've done before 7th of October on thinking on the connection between gender and sustainability, between gender and climate justice, on systematic discrimination. My, my, my work uh, focuses on transformative changes and ways to to really move forward structural changes for an equal society, both in Israel and globally. Uh, I was really instrumental in the protests uh, of uh, the, the um, women's movement uh, in Israel. Um, we've had uh, quite a few uh, intensive months of protests uh, to ensure gender equality is respected and that we have equal representation, which we uh, I can share. Uh, Israel now is, at the, um, is really um, struggling and at the lowest rate of representation of women in every decision-making body that you can uh, think of. And I think it's something to push forward uh, in the future uh, to the next chapter of Israel. After the war, we have to make sure Israel has uh, uh, women in its leadership and quotas, and this cannot uh, last anymore, the situation where we are uh, not represented. So just uh, that was a little bit to anchor myself and my personality um, before 7th of October. So uh, really uh, since 7th of October, I found myself uh, with this uh, unimaginable position um, a task that I never asked for myself uh, to be a voice to those women and children who were um, really most brutally uh, silenced by Hamas terrorists on the day of 7th of October. And um, and it started, I, I, if it's okay, I'm going to share it uh, as a regular conversation between me and you, even though I can't hear you, but we'll open this for, for questions. So really on the first day of 7th of October as international law expert, um, we, we knew that we're witnessing uh, crimes against humanity, against our eyes, the hostage taking, the people, as you heard, uh, soldiers, I wanna say, um, called their parents, uh, soldiers are graduate uh, high school graduates here in Israel. For people, it sounds wow, they're soldiers, but m most soldiers that were around the Gaza Strip are girls, high school gra graduates, uh, 18 and 19. For me, they're just girls. Uh, we served at the surveillance units. 
around the Gaza Strip and they were calling uh, to their parents, asking them for help uh, to come and rescue them. And also families, uh, we, we spent hours listening to families screaming, they're burning us alive. We're hiding in the shelters. They're coming in, they're throwing grenade at us. It was just, we couldn't believe what we we're seeing. We couldn't believe this ha uh, is happening in Israel. And as you know, Israel is such a small country. We have this really, from my house to where everything happened, it's barely uh, an hour and a half. And it was just um, something that is unimaginable. But as I said, we quickly understood that this is not a national uh, event. It's gonna be internationally tried. It's gonna be, it's gonna involve the international community uh, very deeply. Um, Again, we saw uh, these heinous war crimes and the magnitude of the event, it was very clear to us. And so in the days after the, the um, 7th of October, maybe I should also share that we felt exist existential fear, a fear like never before, that this is the end, that we're facing the end. Wow, okay, that we're facing the end of our country. And I wanna be uh, grateful, grateful to you uh, in the EU. I, I felt like uh, the president of the EU, the vice president of the EU, prominent figures were very loud in uh, those days of fear, expressing their uh, solidarity with Israel. We say that the world is as kept silent, but it's not true. I always say that I, I spoke yesterday with Jewish communities and all through this week, I'm, I'm actually joining from New York. I'm meeting with Jewish community here in the United States uh, in this delegation, leadership delegation. And the first thing that I'm saying is that we do have allies. We're not alone. I, I truly want to emphasize this. The first report that I've written in the second week of the war mentioned Roberta Mozzella and extensively it ends the report that I uh, I wrote ends with uh, the words of uh, um, her, her speech. And I wanna say that, um, and, and last week we've met with the president of the Bundestag and the vice president of the EU and, and many ambassadors, EU ambassadors that have expressed their standing with Israel. So I wanna be grateful for, for our EU partners and we're not alone in that. Uh, what was surprising was the UN, this is what I'm emphasizing, UN uh, international organization have failed us all. Not only Israel, they failed uh, women in general, humanity in general. They are abusing the international system and have ignored what happened in Israel. We were at the first week, we were very, uh, we were, um, discussing between us, we saw another statement and another statement contextualizing the crimes or providing false information to the entire human rights movement. And more terribly, UN uh, women's rights bodies have kept silent, have uh, really, um, have really, uh, just uh, did not say anything about what happened in, in Israel. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll soon share what does it mean to, to, be, to be silent, what the, the implications of this silence. But we were very naively thinking, okay, something is wrong. They might not have information. Let's draft this quick report uh, that I showed you. Let's write to them, let's describe, let's give them uh, credible information. And once they'll have it, they'll probably it's our colleagues, right? We have, we all have colleagues at the UN. We're going to write to them officially and unofficially. And I got more than 160 uh, law professors, international law professors, signing this report. For, uh, unfortunately, even writing this report was traumatizing because as a legal scholar, I felt the need to search for evidence at the very first week. Um, when I gathered this group of scholars together and um, and even what I understood is that the public in Israel did not know uh, a, a lot of what, of what happened, but they knew, they knew more than us at the UN and they had access to more information that we had. 
and, and yet they, they kept silent and they started reporting about the situation in Gaza in ways that dehumanize the Israeli public, dehumanize uh, our country, our army, our, our right to exist um, very, very fundamentally. And, and as I said, we sent these reports uh, thinking naively that once they get it from us, they'll report it. We are experts just like them. We are NGOs, we are academia, academia, um, but they ignored it for weeks. At first I, I started, um, I gave explanation. I said, maybe it's a structural failure. The UN women doesn't have, I, I thought about all the excuses I could have and I don't need to find any excuse. There is no excuse to keeping silent. I said it from the beginning. There's no justification to uh, not to uh, condemn the atrocities that we've seen here. Uh, again, as I say, it's a betrayal not only in Israel it's, uh, or in Israeli women, it's a betrayal in, in humanity. Especially when you know as feminist scholars, the many ways women are helpless in this situation. We don't have a, a voice in, in uh, many uh, national security places. We don't have a voice in this conflict. And we're, we now, uh, our voice is being taken from us from the very uh, organizations that are supposed to protect us. Um, and, uh, one, and, and then I want to say that two other missions uh, revealed them, themselves. I I'll focus on one. Uh, first of all, um, we had to uh, assist national authorities because they needed help in understanding uh, trauma-informed approach to, the, to this crisis, uh, especially in regards to sexual violence during war. And, uh, and, and so experts in my commission have, uh, have become a source of assisting uh, the, uh, the authorities nationally, the authorities uh, and guiding them through these very delicate issues of sexual based crimes. The other most important uh, mission that we have is to, the, again, it revealed itself because we started collecting information and, and, and what happened is that people started sending us a lot of information and um, and so we understood that we have the mission of documenting every piece of information, of creating a credible archive. Dr. Saraya Awani, she's uh, the head of the Gender Studies program at Ben Gurion University. She's a peace activist. She's a historian of war crimes. She heads the uh, uh, war crimes against women. She heads our archive, and I want to tell you that this is the most difficult work. We are collecting information in ways that are exposing us to the most difficult data every day. The stories and, and the, the images and the testimonies that we get uh, are terrible. I'll say about that, that we are only in the beginning. We are authenticating uh, the information that we get. It's going to take years. Sometimes I feel like people want to know now, but um, it's not something that we can um, force provide. Sorry, I hear someone on the Zoom. Um, so uh, what I wanted to say uh, is that we're collecting this information. We have protocols uh, indicating of, of what we know about each of these uh, uh, each of these um, pieces of information, because unlike a journalist, even we want to know everything. We want to we want to collect everything and slowly. For instance, if there's someone sending me a sentence about what happened in Berry, I'm gonna keep it because maybe in five years I'll get another piece of information that would shed light on this very initial report that we have. Um, and we are, uh, as I said, there is a protocol indicating what we know, we know and to what level. Uh, some cases we, we have a hospital or, or we have strong confirmations, but others were just at the beginning of understanding. And when someone asks me, I think it will take, in one year, we might be uh, at the end of the beginning. And people are asking me, how do you know this is not fake? How do you know this is um this has happened so i want to say a few things first of all i wish i hope that everything will find uh is not true everything will prove itself 
uh, it's it just, of course, it's not, um, unfortunately, it's not the case. We are uh, the opposite way around. A lot of the things that we even didn't believe happened, um, that we were, you know, we were, it was hard to comprehend that something like did happen. We are uh, receiving more information from different sources. And I'll share more about the, this process of how we get the information and how we got it in the past few weeks and 7th of October. Um, but uh, it's this process of uh, collecting all these uh, uh, evidence from different sources in different times and locations. And I wanna say that we, we have multiple, multiple uh, evidence of uh, gender-based crimes and crimes, uh, the most inhumane killings and tortures of, of women and sexual violence crimes in, in different locations um, in Israel and against children. And I want to say also something about that. Uh, people are obsessed. I feel like people around us are obsessed with sexual crimes, but it's not only sexual based crimes. As I said, it's also torture in the most inhumane ways. Even what we saw, um, even what we saw um, now, a lot of people got uh, at the um, got information of their relatives being uh, tortured on social media uh, that day. So um, it, we, we see different ways and different ways in which tor uh, Hamas has uh, terrorized the Israeli uh, community and the Israeli society and all of us really. It's not only in Israel. What I understand now being in the United States, we used to say 9 million Israelis are traumatized but really what I'm seeing is that millions of Jews around the world are traumatized. I'm meeting them and we're crying here day and night. They come in and hear me and with, with their eyes red. Uh, and, and so we have to, to, to understand that it's a, a, it's a trauma to the entire Jewish people. And I'm sure you understand it with us. Um, just it's something that I realized because I was in Israel and I didn't realize this is something we all share uh, this deeply. Um, and I wanted to um, talk about, just before getting into, about the silence. So uh, the fact that uh, I, I appeared before the uh, five members of the CEDAW committee uh, a day after they released a statement not mentioning the 7th of October. You and women for weeks did not mention the, the 7th of October. And as I said, uh, it's, the problem is much greater than just keeping silence or betrayal in us Israelis. They're, um, the fact that they have not responded meant that they fueled hatred campaigns against Jews. They, flew, they fueled uh, anti-Semitic campaigns around the world. They, they fueled denial campaigns around the world. It is as if I'm, I'm you know, for years I'm following their statements and, ev and, and everything. And, and seeing the ways that they held campaigns against Israel, uh, I want to say it's not only against Israel. It's, it became this propaganda of uh, an abuse, as I said, of international uh, bodies uh, and of their capability. And um, um, I wanted to say about that that I told them that they are undermining the international legal system. They are undermining everything we've worked for for decades. Um, I asked them, uh, they, they, would, they wouldn't even mention the hostages. So in that statement that the CEDAW committee, if, if, if you, you know the CEDAW committee is the experts committee um, on gender equality and, and women's, uh, and the, the committee on the elimination of discrimination against women, they're experts committee, they don't have a political agenda. They were supposed to be the first to condemn the crimes to mentioned the crimes against humanity, the hostage taking of women, of children, of, it was, and they were not even able to mention these crimes. So I told them, is there international law for Israeli women? Are we gonna be protected? Um, are, we, are Israeli women even human? I, I'm telling you these questions are haunting me. I'm not sure I would be able to teach international law anymore. And I have to say, that I'm such an enthusiastic lecturer on these issues. I, even though we knew always that the, the uh, UN system is politically charged and, and has 
a bias, a structural bias against Israel in many procedures, um, I've never imagined that they wouldn't be able to condemn with us, um, with, West, with the Western world, these kinds of atrocities. Um, I wanted to say something else about that, um, about this inability. Never mind, I'll, I'll remember. Um, Kohav, we can always go back to this later. Uh, I see that uh, Shelly is back with us and I wanted to ask if there are any questions from, from our, yeah. Uh, I'm not finished, maybe one more minute. Okay, sure, go ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to say, um, just to give you a brief, to mention a brief uh, fraction uh, of what we know, uh, really a fraction. So the evidence and the magnitude, as I said, of the brutality of the sexual and gender-based violence perpetrated by Hamas um, is overwhelming and corroborated by multiple sources. Um, I want to say that chronologically, what we saw that the first evidence that emerged as, was as early, as I said, it's the morning of uh, Saturday, October 7th, during the attacks themselves, as Hamas proudly posted the images and live streamed videos of the attacks on social media. I want to say this is probably the most documented atrocity humanity has known. And still the, uh, we uh, experience denial. This is really something that I can't explain. Um, and this included videos and, uh, and live videos and images of Israeli women being stripped, tortured, pushed naked uh, into the Gaza Strip, paraded and other uh, unspeakable um, horrors that we've seen. Um, as I said, some of these horrors were broadcasted to the families themselves of the victim, uh, creating another form of torture and terrorizing of our society. Next, uh, of what we've seen as, uh, at the Civil Commission, uh, which I want to say the Civil Commission on the Crimes uh, of Hamas against Women and Children is an independent body. We're non-governmental. We are a group of experts and NGOs working on these issues. Um, and, and we started, as I said, the first evidence that we collected was of Hamas itself. Next came reports of eyewitnesses, survivors from the different locations in Israel and from the Novo Festival reporting that they witnessed women being raped around them and, and as they themselves, they were hiding uh, for their lives in the bushes, trying to avoid detection by the terrorists. Next came images, uh, um, I want to say of the first uh, first responders uh, that went to collect the bodies, including reports uh, of paramedics uh, who entered home uh, in Berry, for example, to find a 14 and 15 year old girls naked in their own bedroom, um, murdered and, um, and shot in their heads. Uh, laying with their legs spread and semen on their backs and uh, in a puddle of their own blood. And these are, as I said, girls. Next came um, uh, evidence, and I'll finish with that evidence from uh, morgue staff uh, sharing the ways that uh, they found the bodies in mutilated ways with their pelvic bone, uh, bones broken, many uh, broken parts, brutality. I can send information. I'll send you information of one very um important witness that i think uh, you should hear her name is sherry mandez she prepared the bodies of soldiers to burial um and she her testimonies are just so sound as if they come from the holocaust um and and last i want to say that the videos of uh, we we got videos of the testimonies of hamas terrorists themselves openly admitting that their mission was to rape and dirty and humiliate israeli women and girls and murder babies they even explained that they received permission by uh, and orders to perpetrate these horrific crimes uh, by their religious uh, leaders in order to instill uh, fear in the israeli public and I want to say that um, this is something that is going to terrorize us for generations. And uh, I think um, that we, that I'll appreciate every, um, I want to say that I'll appreciate every uh, partnership in understanding the ways to collect this uh, information in, um, in 
uh, pr preparing together reports on this uh, on these issues, creating a partnership in which we can learn from your experience about working with victims, working, uh, collecting testimonies. We have just begun. We are just in the initial um, in the initial stage of uh, of of everything. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kohav. Um... Ladies and gentlemen, okay we... if I say one short little thing because I, I, yes. I have to go uh, right now. Sorry, I'll, I'll be very short. Um, sorry for having to, to leave in the first of all, Kochav, you're amazing. Thank you. Um, you're amazing and you're inspiring, and I admire you, and I'm looking forward to meeting you here in Israel in person and giving you a huge hug because what you're doing is simply amazing. Um I, I had to leave and I want to say very shortly that, you know, I, was, I, I just got to the part of saying that I was very, very disappointed with the way that uh, women's organizations around the world uh, with emphasis on UN women did not react to the horrible, horrible massacre that occurred on October 7th and not speaking up on behalf of women, innocent women that were murdered, that were raped that were uh, violated and that were taken into hostage uh, in Gaza. You know, I'm a politician, but this has nothing to do with politics, right? No woman on this earth deserves to be treated the way that women were treated on that day. It doesn't matter which country you're from. I'm an opposition member. It has nothing to do with this. There is no coalition or opposition when it comes to the lives of these women. And I feel like I have an obligation to speak up for them and be their voice with you guys and all around the world. And I wanna ask you to please, please be our ambassadors and speak about this, about the things that you've heard. And of course we can supply any sort of videos or sound or things that will help you out. But Speaking up is very important. You know, I issued a letter on behalf of the women, uh, members of the Knesset to UN women, asking them to condemn what happened. This letter remained unanswered. They didn't even respond to it. Only last week, they had a, some sort of a weak response, not to my letter in general, uh, that was trying to give some sort of a, uh, of a comment that was really very, very weak and I was ashamed of it and astonished that this was the reaction from UN women, which is supposed to defend every woman on this earth, including the women in your countries. And it's very important that you speak up. It's very important that you learn about what happened. And I invite you, of course, to come to Israel and we will host you and we will explain and show you anything that we can. And next week I'm coming to Poland and hopefully to other countries, because I feel it's my obligation, my obligation to speak up. Also, my door is open and I'll be very happy to speak with each and every one of you in person. And of course, I'll be happy to give you my contact details and have yours and that we can discuss things together. But we cannot stay silent. We have to speak up. This cannot be something that just happened and everybody ignores or forgets. You know, it happened here, but it can happen anywhere. It won't stop with Israel. This can happen in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, everywhere. Terror has no boundaries. And we now know that terrorists are using sexual assault and war crimes against women within their agenda. So please be our partners in that. And also I wanna say a huge thank you to Ernest for organizing this and for being such great partners of ours. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank Marta, you it's okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Shelley. Marta, is it okay that I'll uh, say two more sentences before we open to questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say that I'm worried now, now that we've heard from uh, UN Women, um, this tweet that they published or this statement that has been even published in a, in a way that minimizes what happened. Uh, and, and we've heard also from the General Secretary General of the UN, I, I must say and share with you that I'm worried. I feel like what they're going to do is this is the indications that I'm getting 
They're going to give the investigation to the most biased body at the UN uh, against Israel under the Human Rights Council, the, the, the commission that has, uh, inquiry commission that has indefinite mandate to investigate Israel as it has already proven it's, um, I'm, I'm not representing the state of Israel. Uh, I'm representing the voice of the victims and I'm, I, I'm really after the weeks of silence making, uh, suggesting that this is the proper body that is going to, um, uh, to, to handle this. I, I really need you with us uh, fighting the, the legitimacy of this uh, commission. We cannot let the commission uh, of the Human Rights Council be the voice of the atrocities. They already uh, express their inability. And I wanna share with you one thing. Uh, I was approached by this uh, commission, by the inquiry team, they even tried to get into my commission. They tried to, uh, one of them said that they, she would love to join the commission. At the beginning, it was just a WhatsApp group. They tried to enter our uh, group and I was very cautious. I, I wasn't sure who it is. And then when I, once I found out she's from the inquiry commission, I told her, wouldn't it be, a, a, um, a, how would you say, um, conflict of interest to join our, I, I, I wouldn't allow it. You're an investigation team. I can't allow you to take part, even though she sounded that she's really want to help us. I wanna share something very trouble that, troubling that we found out. They didn't mean to share it with us, but they told us that on the 7th of October, they formed two investigation teams. One investigation team is supposed to uh, investigate the Hamas's crimes, but the other investigation team is supposed to uh, investigate the crimes of Israel. So as early as the 7th of October, while our children, our women, our, our uh, everyone were, uh, uh, people here were massacred, bodies on the street, uh, they were establishing a, a commission, an inquiry investigation against Israel and against its crimes. They didn't mean to reveal this, but that's just to uh, highlight the illegitimacy of these bodies and their incapability to handle these cases. And about that, I want to say that um, that I, I emphasized yesterday at the UN that we must not only uh, give a voice to the victims, we must make sure that their voice would be a pledge that will reshape the universal, the international system, that will promise a different world for generations to come because they deserve more, uh, humanity deserves more. And we really, there's, there has to be radical transformation at the UN, they should, um, I, there has to be a radical transformation and I, one last thing uh, I do want to say that I'm meeting with feminist organization around the world, and I have to say um, that I found it very empowering. I'm meeting my colleagues, partners uh, in feminist organizations, women's organization around the world, and, and I am finding partners. I feel like I'm even comfortable uh, speaking with women's organization around the world, helping them to find their way to stand with us. So uh, I think uh, that's, this is what I meant when I spoke about partnership and one uh, important um, event that happened is that we met uh, Catherine McKinnon. And, uh, and I wanna say that Catherine McKinnon, she's one of the most pro prominent professors defining international crimes against women. We've met her very uh, early, uh, I think it was two weeks after I established the commission. And um, we were very much, uh, preparing all the information. We are very anxious before meeting with her. Uh, we were part of this war that we are now fighting against denial. We were, um, we knew that she's amazing, but just we wanted to be very diligent in the, the information that we prepare before the meeting. And I just want to share and to demonstrate what, how belief looks like. She went on the Zoom and instead of, um, questioning in us and asking us, what proof do you have? Like the UN bodies uh, now tell us, uh, she, she went on the Zoom and she said, I know you've been through hell. I can't imagine how hard it is for you. How can I be of help? What can I do? I can't, uh, I can't imagine what you've been through. And 
And once she did it, we, we are all human rights experts. We all started crying. Our defenses went down. Just we're able to speak of our fears, to speak, speak of our fears of, of what's happening. I shared with her that I have four children. Uh, one of them is a baby. And we hope we have, I have this plan in my head. What am I going to do with this baby? We're gonna put the baby in the closet. I'm gonna put the two other children under the bed and the fourth one, uh, the, my, my older son. And I have this terrible image. What, what if I'm not able to carry my uh, older ones from the other, they're on the other side of the house. Anyway, we were able to share with her to, to start a different conversation. Once she believed it wasn't even, we were able to, to start another conversation um, of healing, of, of sharing our fears. Um, and that's, it was really important for me to share with you this experience. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Kohav, that was, that was really important. And I really, I cannot even try to imagine how you feel and how, the, how long the healing process will be for you and for everyone in Israel. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions. Do we have any questions? Um, please raise your hand if you have any questions um, or write them in a chat. Uh, I don't see any right now, so let me let me open the Q and A with one question that I would like to ask both of you. Do you think these victims will ever find justice? And if so, how do you how do you envision it? What would that mean to bring justice to all the victims of October 7th? So I want to share that um, I get a lot of questions from international media asking me um, about the evidence the evidence has whether <clears throat> enough information or evidence in the most <clears throat> we were here in the most uh, as an international law expert and and me and my colleagues we do not debate whether the atrocities are proven whether uh, we know that any international tribunal or special tribunal that is going to try these cases is going to have piles of piles of information even before any investigation Israeli uh, Israel authorities are going to start because we're going to see testimonies from survivors from their families uh, and again so much was documented by Hamas by the victims um, themselves calling screaming to their family members that they, they are being burnt alive um, and so I want to say that I imagine um, an independent tribunal uh, exposing the depth of the crimes, the kinds of crimes that we've seen, investigating meticulously the way acted. And I want to give you an example. What I'm seeing now is that Hamas really targeted families as a unit. We don't have a definition. For it. We don't have a violence against family, but we must, and, but we should have, have, have seen, but perhaps international tribunals that will go into it, will see the way that target and torture families in the most inhumane ways, killing children in front of their parents, killing parents in front of their children, um, and the children are survivors. I don't know if we'll be able to take their testimonies. Um, but I, I do want to say that I, I envision an international tribunal that is formed by the most dedicated um, scholars to uh, and, and scholars that have experience in gender-based violence, in anti-Semitism, that are really there to expose everything that happened in the most uh, respectful way to the victims. And, that will find way to remedy. These are the difficult questions that we're gonna face. What would be the remedy for these families? And I think recognition is a huge way to allow them. Recognition of the kinds of the crimes is a huge way to allow us as a people to heal, as society to heal, um, for us to, as humanity to understand how to prevent this. Because this, this was the 
opposite of prevention. This was uh, the reaction of the international system was the opposite of everything we should have seen as humanity's reaction to this. And so um, I imagine that this tribunal would take all of us a step forward into this transformation that I uh, envision of the entire system of its failure and of the kinds of crimes that these victims have, have experienced especially with regard to the crimes against women that are often denied, often go unrecognized, um, even in individual cases, right? Even a rape case usually is not uh, tried. Usually most women would not even go to report what happened to them. So I wanna see um, any tribunal or any, uh, it's gonna be tried in different legal systems, but just exposing what happened to, to women there in in the best way possible, professional way possible. Thank you, Shelley. Would you like to give a short comment on that? Yes, I just want to make a short comment uh, that has nothing to do with the legal side of things. That Kohav is a specialist uh, in that area. I just want to say, you know, unfortunately, many of the victims are no longer with us. So, even if we have uh, justice made in court or in a legal way, which will probably take years, they won't be here to see, to witness this justice. And that's the most horrific fact about that. And I think that maybe one of the things that we as a nation, as a country, um, need to make sure for them, for their justice, for their name, is first of all, to having the world believe that it happened. I can't even uh, believe that I have to convince the world that it happened. That is the first crime, right? And that's something that we must make sure so that justice is done, that, that they're believed, that nobody doubts them, that this happens to them. That's, that's the second thing. And I think that the world has not seen such violence in modern history. Yes. It's no. a new form of, of, of crimes that terrorists are using. And the world needs to study this and get into it because unfortunately, this can happen again. And we had, unfortunately, Hamas leaders saying out loud in interviews around the world that they plan on doing this again. They said it out loud. So we should believe them. And, you know, we had executions that occurred uh, of entire families. And also they, they did it one in front of the other, right? They, they showed the parents how they're killing the children and vice versa. And we had violence, not necessarily sexual violence, but violence that is really indescribable. You know, there was a small, there was a little girl, an eight-year-old girl that the paramedic that came to take care of her said, she told the story. They cut off for her, her arm and they left her there to die for hours. She was alone for eight hours because the entire family was murdered. They cut off her hand and she was alone. And when the paramedic got to her, it was her last few minutes. And she, she hugged her and she felt so bad because this little girl was all alone. She died after eight hours of agony after her parents and her siblings were murdered. I, 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 I'm not sure if we have any um, examples of this kind of violence in modern history. So we should take that very, very seriously. And part of the justice that should be done is first of all, believing them. Thank you. Thank you, um, Shelley. Uh, and we have a, a little sure. just First of all, thank you so much, Shelley. And I think the examples that you give of, of the kinds of crimes that we've seen is, is, is very important. I want to say that we are uh, seeing a pattern that Hamas has mimicked uh, crimes committed in other areas in Bosnia in ways that for me, it's really unimaginable reading. I'm now reading a lot of testimonies from the Bosnia cases, and it feels like as if Hamas really studied the techniques and the ways in which to um, to sure. inflict the most terrible uh, crimes against women. So I want to mention that. And I want to also say, 
um, that, um, um, what did you, uh, you said something that reminded me that uh, we, we must acknowledge that um, we're now seeing, I think we are an entire regime, captives by, uh, by, by a murderous regime. And I think uh, um, it's important that we see human suffering everywhere, but also important that uh, as, as a, I wanna say that I'm the peace uh, and conflict resolution fellow of the U Hebrew University. I'm an ambassador of Itach Ma'aki. I'm, I'm work with women, women and women were in Israel were um, really injured from all religions. I was just uh, got uh, a, yesterday a horrifying story of a Bedouin woman who was on her way on the 7th of October to give birth to her, to a baby and was shot twice on her way to Soroka by, by Hamas. A uh, terrorist, and she lost her baby in ways that the, the baby took the bullets, uh, and uh, she lost an, her baby after 14 hours. This is initial information that we have, and I want to say so. Women from all religions suffers, and women from both sides of the border are suffering uh, from this murderous regime. I think the Western world should be fighting with Israel. It's not. I feel like we're uh, we're being. Um, we need to be uh, even partners in this war. And I think if I would have been, um, if I would have had any voice in, in leading uh, this, uh, this, this, this conflict, I would have made sure that the Western world is, is fighting with us. And uh, because it's not the war of Israel to fight this terrorist organization. And, and it's, it's a, really a war that should be, um, done by all of us and and for the sake of both palestinians and uh israelis I absolutely agree. um we have a question from joan ryan our ceo in london joan can you unmute yourself thanks marta and thank you to both the speakers it um it's, it's obviously difficult to listen to but even more difficult for you to um, say what you need to say to us. I just wondered, you know, um, the UN's, um, the, the UN Women, the gender equality entity, do you think it can have any credibility now? I mean, has it not massively undermined its own credibility in that it, it doesn't seem to have, um, in, uh, you know, made any kind of statement that actually stands with Israeli women and therefore, I don't know how women around the world could have any confidence in them at all, because as you say, it's not just about Israeli women. There's this systematic um, sexual abuse, the use, use of rape as a weapon of war. We see it all around the world, all around the world against women. But mm -hmm. to not make a statement that they stand with the Israeli women and to not be very clear a condemnation of this Hamas attack, which I don't think they have been to now. Um, does this not completely undermine their credibility altogether? That, that why, you know, what should we do about that? Because if they had made those statements, we might not be getting quite mm -hmm. so many people saying, did this really happen? Did, you know, can we believe this and questioning um, this, even in the face of the evidence? And even when they can see the evidence, questioning wh whether it's CGI or, or, or manipulated in some way, which is unbelievable um, that they would do that, incomprehensible and frankly disgusting. Um, I just wondered what your views were about where do we go from here with this mm -hmm. UN Women um, committee entity because it's a it's a shield for this kind of behavior it's, a, it's the absolute opposite of what it is supposed to be now i don't think we can solve this problem now but we can't move on each time from these terrible and horrific crimes M worse on this day this day the 7th of october than than i almost ever seen before i can't think of another example where it was but we've seen it in a, a, across other continents as well. Um, 
mm-hmm. we we need some way of countering this afterwards because they are doing a huge disservice to women all around the world. So I, I completely agree. They failed us all. They really failed us all. I feel like I'm saying to Israelis, it's not just about us. It's really there. They failed humanity so deeply and women all over the world because they are uh, allowing um, a fertile ground for uh, weaponizing women's bodies when they join, um, encouraging it. And they have made very weak statements. Uh, it took them days. They haven't, I was refreshing my emails every day. Um, it took them days and it's, and I met with the prime ministers of, um, of Belgium and of Spain. And we have this, uh, we had a, a, a really incredible conversation for an hour, open and genuine conversation. And they've asked me the same thing. And I think uh, I wanna say that, first of all, uh, what UN Women did uh, in, and also UNICEF and also the CRC, the Committee on the Rights of Children, they, um, uh, their lack of the inability to condemn the atrocities, to initially report them, uh, created instability uh, in the Western world. It, 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 create, it fueled as again, these hatred campaigns and these rages and, and protest, uh, terrible protest uh, in favor of, of this terrorist organization. And they, are, uh, they have risked uh, the stability of the Western world uh, those of us who understand these dynamics understand that the damage that they have caused. So, um, and I wanna say one more thing about that. It's even worse than just keeping silent or saying weak statement. We've seen Rim Al Salem, she's the uh, rapporteur, special rapporteur on violence against women, owning the 7th of October saying that since of 7th of October, there have been atrocities to the Palestine to the Palestinian in Gaza, meaning that she's not only um, uh, denying 7th of October, she's denying that something happened to uh, to us in this. It's really, it's really abuse of, of the international system. And I'm not sure how we're gonna, I told them the prime minister of Belgium and Spain that they would as the, as the leader of the world in this historic moment that we're in, they must find a way to try to to really lead a radical reform in the international system they must lead a radical reform or else our future generations uh would suffer even greater sorrow than what we're seeing now i i would like to add on that i completely agree with each and every word that kohava said and i want to add to that um i think that one of the issues of speaking up is using your voice, each and every one of you, to uh, to speak up and say that this is wrong because it's it, it's outrageous what happened with UN women, outrageous and astonishing and incredible. And I think that if each and every one of you issues a letter as a parliament member or with everyone with his role and saying to them, listen, this is unacceptable and we expect you to condemn this and it, it took you too long and why aren't you doing your job? This is what you're made for. I think that will have an impact. We need to, to have some pressure on UN women. So the first thing is writing letters to them. The second thing, you, you all of you guys have ambassadors within the UN. You should ask the ambassadors to speak up in the UN and, and speak up uh, within committees, um, and maybe issue letters as well on behalf of your countries to UN women. So each and every person here within this Zoom has the strength to, um, to influence what's happening with UN women. Because for me, they are, um, n- we don't need UN women if they're not ju- doing their job. We don't need a title. We need a committee that works for women all around the world. And they haven't done that. They're, they have betrayed their uh, position. They have betrayed our trust as women, not only as Israeli women, as women around the world. So please ask your ambassadors within the UN and please each and every one of you, if you can write a letter and maybe post it on your social media or speak up in your social media and have a video uh, of you speaking about it 
that will make an impact. It's not perfect, but it will make an impact. It's something. And it's I want to than doing nothing. Yeah. And I want to add to that. Uh, I think it's very important what Shelley said. I want to add to that that I'm also uh, want to uh, encourage long term processes. Um, uh, for instance, Canada, I've met with the ambassador of Canada to Israel. She was amazing. We have a long conversation about what we've seen. And I, uh, and she said that she's going to dedicate the entire year to expose the crimes and hold events and make it and invite us to speak in form and to, uh, and to work to <coughs> colleagues at the EU. So I think it's very important. Uh, there is a noise and um and one last thing i want to share that i've become a target it's not uh, i think this anti-semitism that is uh really raging now has targeted they're targeting me they're targeting my academic work uh, and i'm i must say that we're we the support should be to us as individuals and to us as, uh, as uh, human rights advocates um around the world Thank you, both of you. Uh, I also want to, this is this is for our time to wrap up. I want to thank to all the participants who made being here on this call their priority in their very busy schedule. I know that there were many more people who wanted to join us, but had to be at the committee sessions or the votes, or we know that the UK members of UK, UK Parliament actually are participating in the viewing of the of the 45 minute horror movie that includes evidence of Hamas violence, not only sexual violence against women, but in general, the horrific events that took place on October 7th. We will be sharing this uh, recording with the old participants and everyone who wanted to join us. Um, I think that Shelley's and uh, Kohav's call to action is something that we really should address and we should support it. Uh, we as international community really, we really must stand together and firmly believe the testimonies of Israeli women. Um, the silence really must end and uh, we have to acknowledge those atrocities um, and support the survivors and demand justice for Israel Israeli women, but also everyone else in the world. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, Elnet will be definitely even more involved in this issue. And if there is anything that you want to know more, please feel free to contact us or any of our offices, and we'll be happy to connect you to our speakers today. So thank you everyone for joining us. I wish you a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much.